Okay, so we start this event. So once we, Anna and myself, we visited a park in a wonderful beech tree forest. It was on top of a fascinating chalk formation. The park's name was, or garden's name was Lise Lund. It is a 18th century landscape garden on the Danish island of Mern. The garden was created in the 1790s uh, by French nobleman. His name was Antoine de Bosque de la Calmette. And he created this for his wife, Elizabeth, commonly known as Lisa. So the name Lise Lund roughly translated means Lise's Grove. So the nobleman and his wife who traveled widely had become interested in Jean-Jacques Rousseau's philosophy of naturalism in the Age of Enlightenment. As a result, Antoine designed the park in the romantic spirit of the time as a laughing gift for his wife. A garden on top of a beautiful landscape. Is there a better gift for a declaration of love that needs no words? So, I'm more than pleased to be the announcer of two gifts tonight. The lecture tonight is generously supported by the Harlan Thompson Lecture Fund. The fund was established by Harlan Thompson in 2011, former Dean of the Faculty of Architecture. This endowment fund supports participants to join us from a range of design and research disciplines, recognizing projects whose significance extends beyond any one profession or field. So thank you, Harling, for your gift. Thank you, Brandy, for maintaining our successful partnerships. Gina Ancelone, a filmmaker, said about our guest speaker, quote, he is a man in his 80th year who is constantly jumping an airplane headed to some far away place. He quite literally never stops moving. Our guest was almost in the airplane to Winnipeg in February this year. We already booked the table at the restaurant. We didn't decide about the food and the wine so far, but we ordered a whole pile of napkins, but we had to postpone everything, but we never canceled. So I really like the idea that for 90 minutes, this very dynamic young man will spend his time with us and talk about his unique take on the world, his deeply social concerns, and his push for art and humanity in design. So welcome, Laurie Olin. Well, thank you, Dietmar, very much. Um, I, I'm honored. and that you've invited me, that your school has asked me to give this talk tonight. It's a great privilege and um, I'm delighted. So le let me launch into the talk uh, and also hello to all of you wherever you are since we're all in this scattered working from home mode. But anyway, let me, let me go forward and let's begin. Um, I'm talking about practice. I'm gonna talk about research and I'm gonna talk about time a bit. Um, our practice here in Philadelphia began in 1976, which is 44 years ago, a few years after I had begun teaching at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. And several of the ideas that we were developing in the landscape department here under Ian McCarg had to do with ecological planning and design. And, and these ideas turned out to be central to our work. And one of these was the development of data pertinent to the history or to the physical and social background of an area. It's analysis and the synthesis through overlay mapping to determine guidelines and proposals for suitable physical and policy plans for regions and for particular sites. And the, but the nature and the majority of most of the projects that came our way, however, turned out to be mostly limited, even if large urban sites of great complexity and that had been radically altered from their natural state. And nevertheless, I think we tried to produce substantial urban designs, parks and campuses that had a high social benefit 
and were well received for their aesthetic as well as their functional qualities and uh, some meaningful connection to the local and to the regional citizens. And many of these were constructed on artificial sites, uh, such as this project, Director Park in downtown Portland, Oregon. It's built on top of five stories of an underground parking garage. Or as in this particular example, it's a two and a half acre subalpine meadow in downtown Salt Lake City, Utah, that we conceived of and executed on top of a conference center, which seats 2,000 people downstairs, which is more than see the Utah Jazz just down the street or in their arena. And this, this is literally a case of Rus in Urbs, the, the bringing of the country into the city. And in this case, the native vegetation of the nearby Wasatch range of the Rocky Mountains. Well, limited in scope as some of these projects have been, such as this, the Memorial for the Murdered Jews of Europe in Berlin that I did years ago with Peter Eisenman, we've consistently attempted to engage each place and each project with the people and the history and the moment that we're doing it, that we're living. And in the course of this, our office has pursued knowledge and understanding of traditional building materials, as well as concerning ourselves with how to advance our own technology and our understanding. So our practice really, I think, is pretty normal in its daily activities. You know, people meet in the office, we work individually, we work in teams. We use all the currently available digital technology and communications like tonight, while we're maintaining historically proven methods such as hand drawing and physical models. We use them all, we, we sketch, we study, we make presentations like everyone else. And we spend time in the office travel, and we also travel, we meet with clients and with consultants, with collaborating disciplines and that sort of thing. With, we meet with the public, we meet with governing agencies, nurseries, quarries, manufacturers, you know, on construction sites, all that sort of thing. But our office is also a bit different from many professional firms that represent the industry, which we call architecture. And, and development, as you can see here in these two photographs. One on the left is a prominent architectural firm that will be unnamed and looks like a lot of them. And the one that messy scene on the right is our studio, which in addition to its artistic and collaborative attributes, it also embraces research. In the course of doing this, we engage in a variety of research areas and methods. And some you know, are below the radar, they're hardly noticed. Some are conventional and well understood and some are not known or perceived or even valued by others, particularly many of our colleagues in academia. Much of this research, we'll call it, and its application is deeply embedded in our particular form of landscape architectural practice. Let me consider the topic of research for a moment for what, what it is without all the mystification and hyperbole that often cloaks it in academia, I generally think of research as consisting of three types. Uh, I think of scientific research, I think of humanities research, and I think of artistic research. And I think each one has its habits, its achievements, and its very much limitations. In academia and the great research universities of the US and Canada, it's been my experience to note that many of those who are engaged in each of these important aspects of human creativity, unfortunately, often have some skepticism and disdain for the other, which needless to say, leads to misunderstanding. Now, scientific research regards theories and explanations of nature, its properties, its processes. It makes possible various practical applications. And in the last century, it became highly dependent upon mathematics and quantitative methods of measurement for documentation and verification. Some of this work most familiar to our fields concerns energy, climate, materials, structural and topological systems, various works of applied chemistry, biology, ecology, physics, hydrology, earth sciences, that sort of thing. Well, humanities research, on the other hand, in recent decades has not necessarily searched for or even believed in finding single or supposed correct answers, but has instead explored issues and details concerning 
what are really very interesting or important questions regarding social, political, cultural, ethnic, economic, and ethical topics. Historical research, for example, leading, you know, about art and architecture that employs primary sources and evidence, that's one example. So too would be recent work regarding social interaction in public settings and the, you know, the therapeutic nature of particular environments, such as the, you know, the well-being of medical and recovering patients from, or people suffering from Alzheimer's, that sort of thing. But then there's artistic research. It's also sometimes referred to as practice-based research, and it's probably the least understood of them all. It encompasses creative work, both the process and the result. And it offers alternative results from scientific and humanities research that it, it regards you know, possibilities of reality and of knowledge or of what might be. Excuse me, it's speculative. Do you want to go and give notes? It's not definitive, and it's capable of producing new and previously unanticipated or predictable associations and results. So whether in music or theater or poetry or the visual arts or dance or architecture or landscape architecture, I think because success is almost exclusively qualitative, this is a form of endeavor that since that it's neither quantifiable or verifiable. Most academics in science and the humanities have a great difficulty in assessing it and what we do. Although in my experience, when they're confronted with examples of excellence, they recognize it and they appreciate it. Personally, I've had the good fortune to be introduced to research as a young person in Fairbanks, Alaska, where people studying the geology, the stratosphere, the permafrost, wildlife, the old Bering Sea culture, contemporary indigenous peoples were all about the town. They, we, you know, there was a local university with scientists and they were in and out of our house. In high school, I collected Pleistocene fossils with a renowned paleontologist. This is a drawing of me doing a, I'm at Whitehorse next to the Yukon River there drawing the sternwheelers the last, one of the last years they were still in the river. Well, later as a young architect and artist in Seattle, I, I embarked on an independent study of Skid Road, uh, the community of people that are generally disdained by the middle class and others. And I became publicly embroiled in a successful fight to save Pioneer Square and the Pike Place Market from a disastrous plan for urban renewal that would have demolished large and important historic portions of the city of Seattle. Well, dropping out of architecture in 1967 for various reasons, I spent considerable time living in cabins on islands on the East Coast and then on the West Coast again, writing and reading and drawing and painting. And I was studying the world around me, often sitting still, observing and drawing intently for long periods of time. And I was quite poor, <laughs> and I was, but I was learning a lot. Um, well, in 1970, I embarked on a number of projects that eventually took me to England and to Italy. A period of study uh, and for me, original research in part culminating in the book, Across the Open Field, an ecological, social and cultural history of the landscape of Southern England, which in part was inspired by the work of Fernand Braudel. Braudel was one of the founders of the Annal School of Historical Writing and Ethnographic Study in Paris, and was the person that sort of, if you didn't coin it, he certainly made popular the phrase, the long durée. Well, during my two years of residence uh, at the American Academy of Rome, um, one of my main goals there was the study of Italian urban life and of other historic landscapes than the ones I'd come to know. And this all had a very deep influence upon me as a designer. So following my return to the States in 1974, I spent the next eight years teaching in the Graduate School of Fine Arts at the University of Pennsylvania, where Ian McCarg, the author of Design Will Nature and our faculty there, were developing methods for ecological planning and design and where architects like Lou Kahn who just died, and Lewis Mumford, the urban historian and critic, among others, 
had made the school a hotbed of both theory and of practice. These natural factor maps, which may look kind of familiar to you, <laughs> they're of the time, hand colored uh, with magic markers. Uh, these often took days to produce at the time, and they, and, but these were the early overlay methods that are now routinely accomplished by students around the world in a matter of an hour or two. Well, two years ago, well, two years later, excuse me, two years later, um, a Penn colleague and a friend of mine from student days in Seattle, Bob Hanna, and I had the good fortune to open an office and to apply what we were learning and teaching in our practice. Here you can see us uh, working on a, in the field, doing field work for a plan for one of the first national parks in Taiwan. Well, a number of people have despaired of applying such ecological and direct methods in urban conditions. But I would assert there is no such thing as a blank slate. There is always something there, such as, as you see here, our mapping of natural conditions for the initial projects of the 1979 Battery Park City Master Plan in Lower Manhattan on the Hudson River um, to help, these were to help us guide our decisions regarding human comfort and, and human use on this very exposed site. You know, we're, we're always looking for what are the invisible things that have to do with the history of a place and of a people and of a particular site. And, Meanwhile, throughout the history of our office, one of our great interests has been in materials, in their source, in their nature, their properties, their history of use, and even beyond their physical structurals, we're interested in their sensual properties, as well as their literary and their cultural references. This is not my preoccupation only. It's also that of my partners. My partners share my interest in various forms of research and sharing the knowledge that we've gained. This is a book by Susan Weiler, who a few years ago that grew out, and one of my partners, a few years ago that grew out of our many experiments and experience with building landscapes over architectural structure, something that I'd explored at length years before in the ruins of Imperial Rome and that we applied to our earliest projects, one of which you see below here, and that's Bryant Park from 1982, which it has several miles of book stacks underneath it today. Um, craft may seem an odd topic to mention in relationship to research, but given the loss of so much traditional knowledge and skills as a result of modern economics and changing methods of both education and construction, we have had to take it on also to in order to build well. We've had to do research to find out how people actually used to build things so well so that we could accomplish things as well as they were done centuries ago. The, I guess in order to foster research, one of the things is that we think we've developed a library in our office. Well, if we have a full-time librarian and a curator for our archives and our library includes both analog and digital materials. It includes books, journals, drawings, photos, and other images, as well as all the physical samples that we have managed to accrue as well and materials. We also have a research group in the office and a committee that initiates and promulgates the results of the research. There we go. Now, from my point of view, it is always Research always begins with firsthand experience, whether you're in a lab chemistry laboratory or whether you're a landscape architect. All forms of research really begin with an idea of what to look at and whether it by accident or hunch, and then very careful systematic observation, description, and evaluation of something. Much of my sketching and recording over the years has begun as personal or it's the result of curiosity. It's, it's not tied to a particular academic or professional agenda. And it's occurred from an abiding interest in the natural world and the social world. The natural world initially in the Pacific Northwest where I grew up and spent several formative periods, but then later in Europe and then finally back all over America, North America. I think there is absolutely no substitute for firsthand experience, for learning to look carefully 
and simply sitting still long enough to make a careful record of the subject of one's interest. In the course of what may seem as a random set of encounters with the world, I've filled over 170 sketchbooks and draw with drawings and notes just from being there and from paying attention. Often repeated visits, at different seasons, times of day, over a number of years, noting physical changes in usage. And I think this could be characterized as a non-directed form of qualitative research, especially concerned with the quotidian or the common ordinary things and the aesthetic judgments and observations. Still, the first step in all research is to select something of consequence and to describe it carefully. At the urging of friends and family, I have to say, my wife kept saying, what are you going to do with all those sketchbooks? I've begun to publish some of the contents. The first such of these was Be Seated, uh, the book you see there on the left, which is a set of essays on the history of public seating in the Western world and, and of our experiences. And then this past June, I just published this other book, French Sketchbooks, with a selection of drawings and observations from 1967 to the present. If all goes well, the next work will be a volume on Italy and with drawings and observations from 1972 to the present. Then I get around to, if people are still interested, uh, sketchbooks from across America, north to south, Canada, Alaska to Mexico, east coast to west coast. Well, professionally, our office has been involved in much more directed and quantitative social investigation and research. First, beginning in Bryant Park in 1982, we had access to a study that was initiated by William H. White, Holly White. It was funded by the Rockefeller Brothers Fund and it regarded the social activities in what was then known around town as Needle Park. Um, Holly White's project for public spaces documented the activities that you see here, the, the usage throughout the day, men and women, and times and that sort of thing. And then, the activities, heavy drug sale, moderate drug sale, heavy drug smoking, moderate drug smoking, sleeping, urination, et cetera. Anyway, he, they, they mapped and figured out what was really going on. And White went on to produce a film from this and a remarkable, well, a, a quite remarkable uh, little book, tiny book, The Social Life of Small Urban Spaces, which confirmed and added to my own observations the, of thoughts about social behavior in the public realm. It also provided the program for our, the project. It gave us the tips and the clues of what we should be doing to pry this thing apart and how to make it socially successful, what to add, what to take out. Well, the, right, the results have been widely disseminated, as you know, probably, and have been influential. And subsequently, following more years of teaching at Penn with several anthropologists on our faculty, our office, like many of our peers, has conducted public workshops, you know, interviews, surveys, that sort of thing, in the course of drawing plans for public parks and urban developments. One concern of mine about the, in the use of public space and is an ongoing question about regarding how we sit, where and how long. And it's led to working with clients and industry, and it's also led to continuing experiments in production of outdoor seating, not for profit for us particularly, but for the sake of our projects and for the sheer fun of it. This is an old subject, but like many that have to do with qualitative and aesthetic issues, comfort and economy, it's inexhaustible. Here are a number of people you can see from our office, young professionals. Uh, they're differing in size and shape. They're all trying out a particular profile of a mock-up that we made last fall in the office for one of Philadelphia's historic squares, uh, Rittenhouse Square, which, by the way, was approved by the board last night, and they're going to go ahead with it. So that's, that's how it happens. Community meetings, as many of you know, can be exhausting. They can lead to controversy and disappointment if they're not executed skillfully. A key is listening and paying attention to what people really need and what they feel and a trying to understand what is really going on and not be swayed overly by cliches or captured by hobby horse zealots and fringe advocates who always show up. I mean, these are sessions that you see or have been recorded by us in California and Texas, these slides here. Um, 
I, worthy results, though, can be achieved in part from such community meetings, which can go for a year or more, such as this score, this matrix for a park in Houston, Herman Park, where we gradually came to know many individuals in the community. Some became dear friends. It, not, it wasn't just the public administration we ended up knowing. This plan took a year longer than they thought was going to take to produce and, and that its sponsors anticipated or had budgeted. But the outcome, a series of projects that have transformed Herman Park over a period of 20 years with over a dozen design firms realizing different portions of the plan, it's been stunning. And it's changed the city in very, very good ways. Another form of research that we've undertaken off and on for years when possible has been post-occupancy evaluation or what's called POE. In, in particular, the social use and the behavior of people in places that we've been. Problems with planting or materials when they show up usually happen rather quickly. We tend to deal with them with the clients who are still usually in a close working relationship, but and with the contractors and the owners, but whatever lessons are learned from that get fed into the, the office base, uh, knowledge base pretty fast. But the more important other stuff that takes longer is the, how did it work socially? What's going on? Did we know what we were doing and does it work to the community? And this was one of the pilot projects that was developed for the National Sustainable Sites uh, Initiative a few years ago. We used, this as one of the pilot projects for that. And here you see one of the diagrams. This particular project was really, it was an updated version of the field techniques that were employed by Holly White and others in Project for Public Spaces back many years before to count and study the location, the movement, the activities in Canal Park in Washington, DC at different times of the day. So that it could be, this kind of study can easily be extended through, you know, other seasons and over a number of years. But we were, you know, we, this was a brief study, but the point is this is replicable stuff. This is, this is real, this is original research and it's real data, it's real science, it's quantitative. Um, anyway, a different question has haunted the field it's in our office and it's become important. And while we were working on a project in, it was a student, it was a recent project for a student residential uh, complex at my alma mater, the University of Washington, Seattle. My intent there was to reintroduce the native ecological conditions on an extensive hillside site that was had been completely ruined and how to do this. And while it was possible, it was made very difficult given the loss of the original complex soils and the difficulty of obtaining anything of suitable quality. And my partner, Richard Rourke, began several years of campaign to produce what was actually needed. And he worked with the local biologists, with soil scientists, with faculty members uh, from the biology department and the forestry department, and several municipal waste treatment agencies in Tacoma and Seattle, and with some sand and gravel suppliers. So it was a complicated group of people over time. But it led Richard and our research group in the office into developing a series of pilot studies on creating soils with a combination of urban waste products uh, and, and natural uh, products. And so we've been working with uh, researchers from the nearby Penn Biology School. Grants have been applied for and received, some rather substantial ones, surprisingly enough. And to us, I was surprised. <laughs> and um, the tests have been somewhat promising uh, with the combinations of, of materials and that we've been working on for the last year or two, last year and a half, actually. Um, the study has led my partners into several follow-up projects with an expanded team, including the Department of Landscape Architecture, Temple University, University of Pennsylvania, Phil Crawl, who you may know of, an independent soil scientist, formerly with the US Soil Conservation Service, and with several local industries here in Philadelphia and our office staff. Suffice us to say, we are truly interested in science, but primarily for the purpose of employing applications to our design efforts. A recent and somewhat, to some degree, still ongoing project uh, presented several examples of all this. 
In 2011, which is now nine years ago, we were asked to join a project then in planning and early design stages for a new corporate facility on a 150-acre abandoned suburban Hewlett-Packard site in Silicon Valley. The design that we developed, you can see before and after in these two slides, the design we developed with the architects and the client increased the density of square footage on the site from 2,600,000 square feet to 3,600,000, 3 million, from 2,600,000 to 3,600,000 square feet. In other words, we added a million square foot feet on this site while we reduced the footprint of the buildings by 400,000 square feet. And we actually took the permeable surface that had been there on the site before with all the parking lots and some roads and crap that was there from 42.6 acres to 98 acres. Quite a dramatic change. Well, the design that I proposed incorporated some references to culturally significant historic agricultural planting. Some of Steve Jobs and I were very interested in were orchards and the creation of a new rolling topography with native plants reminiscent to the historic context. Specifically, the nearby coast range and the more distant Sierra foothills and the memory of the meadows and grasslands native to portions of the coastal hills of the South Bay region. This required us to identify and propagate hundreds of thousands of trees, understory shrubs, understory plants, uh, trees and shrubs, and herbaceous plants, as well as several million plugs of various grasses. At the same time, we embarked on a series of experimental test mock-ups with a couple of manufacturers and suppliers with different aggregates and binders to produce several miles of, of the paths and service drives that were gonna be on the site. In large part, this was a desire, it, resulted, it came from a desire to avoid the use of concrete and asphalt, but also how to produce something that was durable and aesthetically sympathetic to our vision, which candidly was a contrivance of a seemingly natural, in quotes, surface. As you are all probably aware, our ideas of nature are primarily a social construction. And landscape architecture habitually uses contrivance and artifice to invoke and suggest something that many people mistake as nature or natural. But what we make is largely an experiment. It's a life-size mock-up. It's in real time. This happens to be an image of one of the jogging trails that we produced on that particular former Hewlett Packard site. It's unremarked upon is this is kind of low level research on nearly every project to ensure its success in, in terms of planting, such as I'm showing you here. It involves soil testing. <laughs> for pH, for organic composition, for its drainage properties. And through lab testing and collecting samples, we figure out what we should be trying to do with what we got to work with. We use all sorts of devices that are very common throughout the field. Well, on this project, we were particularly concerned about the large quantity and particular amount of soil, the kind of soil we wanted. So we engaged two soil scientists of a different type, which led us to study the specific nature of the site and its parts. And we, we got these ancient soil surveys from around the turn of the century before this land had gone out of agriculture and we, to try and figure out what had once been on the site so we could still see if anything was still present in some portions. Well, as luck would have it, we discovered a couple of relatively deep alluvial deposits, which along with modifications of portions of the building excavation, it allowed us to move over a million cubic yards of good soil about and to build the requisite topography and support a wide range of plants. Even so, I was still worried about the meadows, the deep concern about them. I'd done a wildflower meadow on the very first project of our office back in 1976, and I discovered how complex and difficult they can be because people had not been doing them from scratch. Over the years, we, we've done several. We've made them in different climates and different places, and each time we've learned more. One of our conclusions has been that it usually takes about three years to work through the problems of invasives, of partial failures in germination, temporary erosion, secession, that sort of thing, for a meadow to actually become fully established. 
So this led us to developing a series of test plots in two locations in California with different grass and different seed suppliers. We worked with Pacific Sod and San Juan Batista and with Hedgerow Farms near Davis, California, where the California Ag School is. And our interest was to produce several communities of native plants for the different aspects and conditions of the site and to test the mixes and quantities of grasses and of the flowering perennials that we knew had once been in the region and we would like to try and restore. We monitored these plots for a year and a half. We made some conclusions and then we wiped them out and moved on. Some of the resulting meadows are now three years old. Others are only a year and a half. Uh, and after counseling <laughs> the client for patience during that whole first year was really ugly and awful, I'm happy to say that the results have been gratifying to both the client and to us, even as we still continue to work through some of the issues with them. You know, it takes a while to get these things to settle down. So where once Hewlett Packard had a flat site with asphalt parking lots, tip, tilt up buildings, driveways, and that sort of stuff that the banal rubbish that you see all over uh, America, north and south, there now in this area is 150 acres of permeable habitat and recreation features for an increased density of population. Well, at the beginning of the talk, I mentioned a third form of research, which I called artistic research. Possibly one of the best examples of this that I could offer would be Frank Gehry, the architect, seen here uh, with a couple of his experiments in making furniture from ordinary materials, corrugated cardboard, wood strips such as we use in peach baskets and apple crates. I met Frank not long after he'd disturbed his neighbors in the norms of mid-century residential architecture by performing experiments on his own house in Santa Monica. Endlessly curious, Frank was exploring the nature of ordinary building materials and elements, doors, windows, walls, roofs, and people's expectations. Oh, it was marvelous. So well, by good luck, I began working with him on a project in London and then in Barcelona and Frankfurt, Germany in the early 1990s. We got along, uh, we stimulated each other somehow. I enjoyed his playful curiosity and his, and there was great comfort in working through multiple ideas and schemes and throwing things out and trying something else. And in Spain, prior to the Olympics there, while Frank and his staff were working with the CATIA program that they'd recently imported into their office and had been used to develop the Mirage jet of airplanes in France, my office also produced its first set of construction documents on a computer. Our two offices were both crashing into the, this new era of research design and production that was using computers in architecture and landscape architecture. And we were kind of learning how to figure out how to do it together and teaching each other things. Um, Frank's office today, is as much of a laboratory and a pilot manufacturing plant as it is a studio. And it's a marvelous environment to work in, I can assure you. You can see what it looks like. It does not look like your usual architectural office. This is artistic research in depth. One of the best examples I can show you would be of artistic research was the eight year long period that we worked together with Frank and several artists on the design of a residence for Peter Lewis in Cleveland in what was clearly an extended subsidized research project. Out of it came ideas that ended up in other projects of his, the famed museum in Bilbao, Disney Hall, Deutsches Bank uh, interiors on the Pariser plots in Berlin, etc. Well, working with Frank is always a challenge. We never know where things are gonna end up. Everything is questioned. Things keep changing, keep developing until, until they're finally built. This is the project that we did together at MIT, the Stata Center for Computer Science. My notion that buildings are part of the landscape and that their integration may take many forms is welcomed by him. And you know, I think buildings are inherently a piece of the site and they can be part of the site. Nevertheless, no matter what people know or think about Frank's work, it is not capricious. Things have to work. They must make sense technically and economically. Craft is fundamental. Things end up being you know, aesthetically satisfying, but 
they and they're essentially rich as possible, but they work for the client and they work functionally deeply. For all of Frank's interest in form, his buildings work, and they're often more effective than conventional methods. He loves to build, and he always asks, why not? What else? So too do my own partners. And we often land, you know, we work with a different medium most of the time, as exemplified by this reconstruction of a, a river that was once ruined and polluted in downtown Stamford, uh, Connecticut. But it's been transformed by my partner, Cindy Sanders, into a, a quite beautiful natural stream, having taken out a low head dam and doing a whole bunch of other things to figure out what to do with it, the water and let the water expand when it floods and have a place to go. And, but this compelling idea of access to nature in our cities is so powerful and is so necessary that the transformation of polluted waterways into healthy environments needs all the skills and creativity that anyone can bring to bear. And inevitably, it's dependent upon a variety of applications of science and art. So the last example I'm going to use for a project tonight is this one. Well, for a number of years, many people have been trying to figure out what to do about the Los Angeles River. Most of the time, it's pretty empty, but it becomes a very dangerous and raging floodway several times every year because of monsoonal rains. My partners and I gave a design studio at, the, at SciArc, the Southern California Institute of Architecture, a number of years ago, and spent time with the Corps of Engineers, hydrologists, ecologists, local advocates for the natural restoration of a portion of it. Local practitioners and governors and government officials were all looking at it. And we came away concluding it's a really difficult, it's a difficult situation. Well, in March of 2016, four years ago, our office became involved in producing a master plan for the last, for 51 miles of the Los Angeles River. We were invited to join Gary Partners. Actually, Frank called and said, you gotta get out of here. You gotta get out of here. I need your help to join them. And with a large local engineering firm uh, with a strong history of civil engineering and regional projects having to do with hydrology in the river. And in the course of the last four years, our team has reviewed thousands of pages of historic and current planning documents, had a continuous set of meetings with the county supervisors, with public works staff, an omnibus citizen steering committee that has been really a challenge, representatives from 14 cities, the whole while working continuously on the nuts and bolts of a plan and its implementation. Existing conditions. Well, we the first thing to do is figure out what's there and what's going on. And so over a period of nearly two years, our office with that of Frank's embarked on a data and information quest. And the result, the LA River Index, we have made public. It's available on the internet. You guys can go and look at it if you want and call it up and see what we found out. It's a compendium of the physical and social data regarding the health, the situation of the population of the 15 municipalities it ain't just the city of Los Angeles, by the way. Roughly 25% of the population of the state of California lives within an hour's drive of this river. The problem and the opportunity for something creative couldn't be much greater. Nearly all of the LA River Carter and the floodplain it once had have been developed. The river has become exclusively a floodway. It cannot be turned loose without enormous societal costs and problems. So it isn't the same river, of course, at various portions of its length, upstream, downstream, in the middle. Like natural rivers, it has variation as it moves from upland to the sea. And one of our first tasks was to map it and analyze it. Our hydrologists needed to rework all the old existing data and generate new information in light of recent experience and current projections based upon the absolute certainty of climate change, which has been as dramatic in California in recent years as in the Arctic. Hydrologic and climatological facts have ruled out fantasy regarding the concretized channel, turning it into some vegetated state with, you know, you know, fish coming up to spawn. I mean, it's just like, forget it. It's just not in the cards. Uh, it, people dream of it, but it's not going to happen. And the reason is because, of course, the, the, there, there's this huge amount of water that comes down and the, the, Plans that were underway to create a more natural riparian condition up in an area that we call the Narrows 
is it's now been re revealed publicly by the Corps of Engineers, it would increase hazarding and hazard in the flooding of thousands of private properties. Well, despite plans to improve stormwater management throughout this whole vast watershed and all the districts and everybody doing everything they can to catch and keep water and take care of it and clean it, the requirement for, for flood protection is not gonna ease in the future as the frequency and the severity of storms predicted that will result from global climate change along the California seacoast is going to increase. So putting vegetation and parks within the channel of the river or thinking that you're going to get, you know, uh, fish back spawning and swimming up this happy, you know, verdant thing, it, it's just, it's a fantasy. It's impossible. Therefore, so we looked carefully at the census tract information we that was correlated to the path of the river, and we began developing checklists of data regarding problems such as pollution that could be considered in developing any proposals in terms of social justice, community needs, and resources. Because we thought this is more than just a, a, a drainage ditch, more than just a floodway. There's something else we should be thinking about in terms of the opportunities. Then, we coordinated with the information from the UCLA public health data, several key widespread problems just jumped right out at us as particular illnesses like asthma and type two diabetes. And then we looked at the census tracts again to see who lived there and what their poverty rate was and what their other issues were. And lo and behold, we found that six chronic health conditions in the city of LA cost 25 billion annually to the society and that one in four children have are obese and that 1.3 billion was spent on asthma hospital. We said something, <laughs> what, what? The World Health Organization has said that green space and, and healthy, makes for healthy communities, proximity to parks and recreational programs directly relates to reducing childhood and adult obesity, blah, blah. We thought, we connect the dots. It led to an obvious thought. 51 miles of connected open space. The river offers, it, offers an opportunity, but given the existing situation, how could one produce it? What could one really, what could it really turn out to be? So in our experience, the answer meant get out into the community as we are here spending time sharing meals with local residents and each other, learning and knowing the physical and social situation as variations along the river, working with local governments and getting their officials and staff out into the field, making presentations and having meetings and workshops, and only then returning to the studio to test out hunches and ideas, what if. Eventually last year, we arrived at a set of shared and agreed goals, ending up with nine of them that had to do with flood safety, water management, water quality, use storage, supply, habitat and ecosystem support, social support such as equity regarding housing and the homeless who've been living in the river corridor and the floodway, in addition to community access to recreation, health, and cultural facilities. Well, in addition to presenting the data and facts regarding the multiple topics in our final report, one of the most important things I think that designers can do for a community is help them envision things, the, the possibilities for change and improvement in their lives that they can't imagine and offer them the means to obtain them. So we determined that we couldn't just do a plan and turn it over to the county, but we needed to explain the goals and the basis for them and to help the county so that they could help explain it to all of their communities. Within the team, we needed to both understand the physical workings of the river and its potential opportunities for ecological as well as social productivity. And we needed to explain it to those without a hydrologic or ecological background or understanding. Witness the map of the differences here of the reaches of the river and my little doodle of concepts on, of spatial characteristics and relationships derived from the work of Richard Foreman, the ecologist that I'd hired at Harvard many years ago for his formulation of principles in landscape ecology, trying to show that the river offered opportunities to do things we knew about from ecology alongside it, if not in it or on top of it. And this led to our proposal for a range of projects, a series of them. Many of them are small and extra small, spaced fairly regularly along the full length of the 51 mile corridor. So everybody walks the river next to them, there's something that is useful for them. But additionally, we thought there was a need for medium, large, and extra large projects, you know, that again, based upon scale, diversity of the communities and the demonstrated need, 
because the persistent of probable increase of storm events and the determination we couldn't plant the channel without flooding significant portions of the communities. We then developed a series of potential project types that could be deployed alongside the river and above the river in publicly owned and controlled land. All different sorts of projects that you could tie to the river. Several of these were well positioned to uh, contribute significantly to resident and migratory species. Um, that, that seemed clear and, and this suggested specific and not generic solutions. Well, it seems that this is a sort of thing, you know, our, our students have been doing this for, gener for decades. The science behind it is really pretty straightforward at this point. Um, and it's, it's been applied in numerous places around the country, but not to my knowledge at this scale in such a meaningful way in a developed urban situation rolled out as a set of projects that are interrelated. The science behind this has been, you know, it, it's, it's old hat, but off stage, our team has quietly, there's Richard, has quietly been testing out these ideas without making any design proposals in public, but setting the stage for projects that are to follow. We're trying to help establish what their scope and their probable cost might be. Uh, trying to understand what we're saying in this report. This work we've done in Frank's office and in ours has largely been done at our own cost at, as part of the creative research needed to enable projects to come forward over the next several decades. There will be work for many, many people to do, many to many firms, and it surely won't necessarily look like what we've done. And here you see Richard Rourke working with one of our sketch models in Frank's office during one of our monthly team meetings several years before we submitted our plan to the county. For the past four years now, well, now it is up until March, uh, we met regularly. We had regular team meetings, everybody in the room with all the design and planning members of the team. And there was the hydraulic folks, the civil folks, the structural engineers, the architects, the landscape architects, the housing specialists, everybody was there. And these were very intense sessions that lasted several days. Um, where each member brought the material they developed, they brought their stuff to the table and since the last meeting, and we reported on ongoing community sessions that we're having, meetings with public works and officials in the county, so that we could work through what to do next. We continued to work and to meet. Now we're doing it bi-weekly via Zoom, God help us. Oh, it's tiring, but there it is. The master plan has been submitted to the county. It's now going through the public comment and staff review process. And undoubtedly, there's going to be pushback. There's going to be controversy. I mean, how could there not be for such proposals? But the plan will proceed. It's going to proceed. And a number of contracts and portions of the work are being developed right now Then are starting out. One of the final tasks, of course, is always to show what the probable content and outcome of very, these projects would be. People want to know what's it going to be. And here you see a situation of before and after for one of the portions of one of the larger projects, which is at the juncture of the LA River and the Rio Hondo and Southgate and Bell Gardens, which is in East LA adjacent to Cudahy and it's very near Compton. A portion of this group of related projects as shown in this particular sketch of mine on the left is to be a created wetland intended to capture and clean rainfall and to run and runoff from the adjacent community and the highway while it's providing a riparian habitat. The pedestrian circulation here will both function to connect several neighborhoods to the corridor of the river and a new cultural center on the other side of the river, which we've recently begun schematic design on, and as well as a function as a platform for educational programs having to do with natural science. Another part of this ensemble is proposed to be a deck over a portion of the floodway to support a district scale park with passive and active recreation. Again, the technology is old hat. We've been doing landscape over structure for years. What is different is what, where, and who this project is for. Not only will it offer a healthy environment for residents of this area to relax, to play and exercise, but also to come together as, as a community. One of the numerous features will be that water is to be taken from the low flow channel down below and provide a stream and ponds above, again, for wildlife, for play, and for pleasure. As with so much of our work, 
people want to know what it's going to look like, <laughs> even if we haven't designed it all yet. So we've had to make tentative but feasible pre-designed decisions based upon our experience and likely budgets and implementation to show them what these can be. Part of the challenge we're facing today as designers is not only to do work of the highest quality that takes advantage of all manner of research and creativity, but which operates at the scale of the problem. The adjacent projects that you see in this photo of Cupertino in South Bay uh, uh, near San Francisco show the impact that one can have with the vast urban landscapes that have evolved in this past century. It took decades to get to the state of sprawl we're in, and it's gonna take time and resources to rework them so as to enhance people's lives. Our conclusion has been that we should no longer accept that we must choose between nature and the city. Rather, I believe that we must have both the city and nature. As implied in the title of the talk, many of the things I've shown and have discussed, in addition to research, craft, and creativity, time is an aspect of our work. It's both a feature of the medium of landscape and it's the conduction and, and it's a feature of the conditions of its realization. One might jokingly say that landscape architecture is the slow food of the art and design world. Instant gratification is rare. It's a, we're playing the long game, but it has rewards that can't be sped up or gotten quickly. This particular landscape you see here in Ohio, I began to make in the late 1980s. My office and I have maintained a relationship with the owner and worked there off and on continuously for nearly 30 years. I took this picture about a year and a half ago while I was staying there on a visit to check on it to make a few adjustments and additions and work with one of my partners on the site and the site maintenance guys who we've got to know. Landscape architects also need to cultivate patience as well as their projects. These two photos of 16th Street in Denver, Colorado were taken 35 years apart and show the social use and success of the scheme as well as the planning technique that we devised to allow trees to survive and grow with buses continuously driving every day since 1979, a few feet away from them. About five years ago, there was a desire on the part of some of the local business organizations to restore some worn furnishings and make some additions and changes to the street. And I worked on it with them and with some other professionals with ZGF from Portland, friends of ours. When, when, but when I made a public presentation of the proposed changes, the reaction was really negative. I said, well, look, I'm the original designer. I, I know that we can improve on it some, you know, I did it when I was young, I, you know, I made some mistakes. And I was told, forget it. <laughs> they said the street was theirs and no one was gonna mess with it. So it was now to them historic. And I thought, oh boy. So time is a funny thing. The world changes, people change, landscape changes. Time is part of our medium, it's part of our problem, and it's part of the solution. As the writer and art critic, Megan O'Grady, succinctly put it recently in the New York Times, to live well in the city, more conscientiously and more closely with nature, this has long been a preoccupation of post-war architects. And I raised my hand saying, I'm, I'm with you. <laughs> J.B. Jackson, in a pointed passage that I read when I was still a student, wrote, quote, well-designed cities cannot imitate all of nature, but they can incorporate aspects of that which we find so stimulating there. Shapes and forms, passages of shade, pools of light, the play of vegetation, changes of surface and level, views, the splash of water, echoes and music, the harmony of colors, and the unpolluted sun. That has been my goal. Thank you very much. And now, what do I do? Hit end show, I guess. Megan, what do I do now? We're done. Hi. Thank you, Laurie. You could, you could leave, you know, the meadow for a little while. Oh, I leave the meadow. Okay, go back to, to the meadow. Okay. No, I would love to lay down there. Ah. <laughs> enjoy the sunlight and meadow. Yeah. And I could stay there forever. So, thank you so much. That You're was welcome. really enlightening, vigorous, rich, delightful, and I could go on. So, thanks I'm not a lot. Sure what I should do? I can just, just. How do I get rid of this and keep you? 
you, you, you don't have to do anything right now. Okay, then. okay. Stop. So <laughs> we, you we agree. We have time for questions and answers. I think I stopped close to on time. Yeah, no, you are great. We have 30 more minutes for questions and okay. answers, hopefully. Maybe before I open the floor, you know, housekeeping, what we try to do. For those who are not too shy, so feel free to unmute and to activate your video. It would be great to see a few more faces because what I saw, recognized, so the attendance is great, you know, from all over Canada. Ah. There's so many, many names I haven't seen before. Maybe they are from Minneapolis, from <laughs> North Dakota, students there. It's fantastic. For those who are a little bit too shy, you can use your chat and I can switch for the backdrop and I will read a few questions. I have one starting question for you, Noreen. Yeah. So, what did Richard Hack do to bring you on the right track? Or in other words, Say how that did again? He Sorry, did, 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 did. to move from architecture into landscape architecture? What did he do? What did I do? How did oh, I shift? Richard Hack. <laughs> Richard Hegg, uh, well, I was, the only degree I have is a Bachelor of Architecture degree, so everyone should relax about uh, credentials. Um, while, I was an while I was studying architecture, I'd come out from Alaska to the States, as we'd say, and um, the school I was in was like a school you're in, uh, but it only had architecture and it just added planning, and they thought, well, the great schools all have landscape architecture. So they started, they wanted to start a department. So they hired a guy from San Francisco that Tommy Church recommended to them. And his name was Richard Haig. And they didn't know what to do with him while he was writing the curriculum and, and recruiting faculty and trying to get approval for a degree. So they put him in my studio for the first, for a whole year. So, so the, I was in my, I guess, third year of a five-year curriculum. So they put him in our studio and he had a hell of an influence on our studio. A bunch of us ended up later working for him and, um, and uh, five students out of my graduating class of 20 ended up winning the Rome Prize for in landscape architecture, which talk about unnatural selection. That's really something, you know, so. So Rich, Rich was a powerful teacher and mentor. He introduced us to ecology and to Frederick Law Olmsted and to a whole bunch of things, you know. Does that answer your question? The chats. Pardon? No, just when I look in the chat, you know, there's so many. Thank you. Very enjoyable, enjoyable, wonderful. Thank you. Great lecture. Very enlightening. You know, oh. these are the comments uh, okay. we have so far. And there's oh. a question from Owen. Owen is asking, Mr. Olin. Are you a fan of the Grateful Dead? Oh, actually, yeah, some of their records very much. Uh, I, I, uh, I would say Working Man's Dead, yes, is one of my favorite. I have that. And there's a bunch of things. Yes, I do like the Grateful Dead. I hope that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I, you know, there was a period when, uh, when many of us were dropping out and trying to figure out what to do with our lives, and they were actually a fairly important group at that point. This Next question. Don't be more, shy, gang. You know, there are a lot of comments. This, oh. this is incredible. Thank, thank you so much. Oh. And here's a question. Thank you. And what did you change your mind from architecture to lens? Oh, oh okay. landscape. You have the same question? Yeah, so, well, no, but I'll say more about it. Um, yeah. In, in 1967, I was working in New York uh, at Edward Larrabee Barnes office, one of the best architectural firms in North America at the time. Um, and uh, I just, there was something crazy about not only this, well, the time was a crazy time, the sixties, but um, I, 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 ecology happened to me in a way where I started reading an awful lot about natural science and about ecology. And I was, and I became dissatisfied with making objects. I felt I was a bead carver and I was making really great beads, but this, the necklace I was making didn't make any sense and that the world was more complex and that cities were 
needed something different than just more buildings that mere it's i love architecture i i guess i should say first that i love good architecture but i think we have a problem with not knowing how to make ordinary architecture right now and everyone wants everything to be special climax triumphant you know it, it, it's knock your socks off and there is this problem with how to do ordinary things and ordinary uh, is not bad uh, it if if everything were special nothing would be special and and so i i became dis disenchanted with the architectural practice i was uh, as i saw it in the 60s and so i i went and spent a lot of time out in nature by myself in a cabin and reading and thinking and drawing and um you know having my form of a nervous breakdown but i <laughs> it was very productive because I realized that I, there was something else I should be doing. You know, I could do, I was a pretty good architect and I did, you know, word winning stuff. You know, it's like a bear riding a bicycle. They, they can do it, but should they be riding a bicycle? I thought I can do this, but should I be doing this? Is there something I'm better at? Something I, I, that would bring my different interests in pe people and science and nature and design. Is there something else? And, and I, you know, Rich Haig and his example of landscape architecture is what really did it for me eventually. So it's, this is not a rejection of architecture. It's, I don't, I want to do something more difficult, I guess is what the answer is. I, I wanted to raise the ante and I saw landscape architecture as being harder and, and beca partly because no one knew what the rules were and it was, and the medium was, alive and could turn on you at any time was unstable. I love that. So there are mm -hmm. more questions coming in? I hope so. Yeah, I'm going on too long about that one. From Brady Smith. Ah. Have there been habitat studies on the new Apple site after the inclusion of amazing ecology? So did you do habitat studies before? Uh, on the site that you're looking at here, we're continuing to do the afters. Um, we actually, the owner paid for uh, a, a, a series of local scientists to come out and set up some test plots all over the Hewlett Packard site before we began. And they did baseline measurements of the uh, flora and fauna. And afterwards, they, they've been going there every so many months and going back to the same sites using geo, you know, uh, locations. Uh, and the, for instance, the resident bees on this site have gone from about four or five species up to about 18. We think we may get up to about 28 by the time we're done. So we, there, there are ongoing studies of the species on this site that are or have come have starting to arrive and colonize and live on it. Yes. Um, I don't have that data, but we are planning to try and get a hold of it and, and trying to understand it. But it's going on, yes. We would like to do it, but you know, it's a kind of expensive and our clients usually want us just to go away when they get their stuff. So so you have to get grants to go back and then have people let you do it. You know, that's a that's an issue. But the answer is we should do them, yes. Uh, the social studies are great, but you're right. We should be doing more about, okay, well, so how many th things were present when you began and how many are there now? Did you really make the world better and richer? You know, good question. Thank you. You, you definitely made it richer. Amazing design. Next question, please. If there's, yeah, there's another one from Carlo Gonzalez. Mr. Okay. Orling. What other factors have you considered besides the social behavior of people in Bryan Park to develop a program on the area? We're talking about Bryant Park. Is that what you said? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, well, basically we were, I won't say babes in the woods, but that was one of our very first projects. And we, we realized that uh, we had a good idea of what people liked, you know, uh, based upon our own experience. And I'd lived in New York for a number of years, but, um, and then I'd lived in other places. And so I had these ideas that, that Holly White seemed to be verifying. 
One of, I mean, one of the simplest ones was I thought that the, this is going to sound really silly. The idea of movable furniture that people could adjust their own space by picking up furniture and moving it around and, and readjusting their social organization or their uh, utilization of the sun or the shade or whatever, instead of having everything be rigid and fixed. Uh, that was probably one of the things I cared the most about in that project. It's in the heart of Manhattan, and uh, it was clearly going to get a lot of use in where it had been. I'd witnessed a shooting there in 1968, I guess. And so I, I knew about the problems. And so the social was very much more on my mind than any biophysical thing. I didn't want, I, I wanted to keep the trees for the shade. I wanted to get rid of the ivy and put in gravel under the trees to get rid of the rats because we had a giant rat population in the park. Um, so there was a serious problem with how to get rid of some biota. <laughs> uh, but um, uh, that park, we really didn't think about too much else beside the uh, social and the aesthetic issues that uh, do affect social behavior and pleasure and community well-being. Well, I mean, we kept the trees alive, obviously, and we ended up you know, doing these 200 foot long herbaceous borders. I originally was gonna do some basins of water there because I think water, you know, is the blood of the earth and it's a lot of most great spaces and the, the people like to be in have water. You can't keep people away from it. You know, we're, we're deeply attracted to water, but the local parks department and the city council person said, no, you're not going to have water. People, kids will drown, blah, blah, blah. They didn't want to maintain it. So I think what now what do I do? I, I propose these long or bit flower borders, herbaceous borders. Uh, they're about 200 feet long, and um, one is shady and one is sunny, and that's a problem. Uh, but um, and we we did that, and that seemed to satisfy a lot of the the yearning for change and seasonal color and delight and texture that people want. That the monochroma the the mono specific stands of trees, although they were produced a microclimate, was very beneficial were, you know, boring in many ways. It's like the Tuileries, it's beautiful. And, but, you know, people think, well, where's, where's, this, where's the next thing? What's changing? What's pretty here? <laughs> so so that, the answer to your question is, no, we didn't think it too much beside the social with that, except keeping the stuff we wanted alive, alive. Yeah. I think answers Carlos' questions. And there's another one from Jessica Sutor. So thank you for the lecture. You are an engaging storyteller. <laughs> is there a particular right. role you believe narrative plays in the development of the design for a site? If there is one, do you find that the driving narrative is informed by the uncovering of the site through methods such as mapping and community, and community engagement? Complicated question with, with several questions, uh, and I will try and unpack them. Um, narrative. Uh, I think <laughs> almost we can't express ourselves usually without narrative, and, and people like a good story, but the narrative allows you to help people understand and see something and follow your train of thought. And so I think narrative is important, but the narrative that a site has, you know, if you read some of the interesting work that's been done in the last, you know, 15 years or so, uh, I would say that quite often a designer will think of a story that he's going to use as a basis for, you know, metaphor for something for a site, and you'll, then the, he or she will then do this. <laughs> They will build out, they'll tell people about it and they'll say, oh, this is about the legend of whatever. And, and, they, and, and everybody nods and says, that's cool. And, and then they build the thing and uh, it, it, it gets it done. But later other people come to the site and they don't know that story. They just see the site. And so they make up other stories or they have been told the story by someone as a kind of urban legend or not. And, the, the what it takes to produce something on our part as the designers uh, may be 
not accessible or that useful or interesting to the end user, the, the population who it's really for. You know, it's like, so Yeats was a great poet and he believed a lot of nutty things about Rosicrucianism and table tipping and stuff like that. And as a poet I studied with once said, well, you know, it doesn't matter what kind of nutty stuff it took him to get done. When he finished, he had a poem and I've got the poem and I could read it. And, and the, the thing is that, that the, there is the, the narrative that participants uh, engage in or develop for themselves on sites. But the truth really is that I have always thought that, well, when you go to a place, there is the history of it. There are the people who are there first. So when I was working in Denver on that street, uh, I, I found myself thinking about the people who came first. And uh, even though they, it was a group of different uh, Native Americans moved through their different centuries, but I found myself looking at um, a book of Navajo, 19th century Navajo trading blankets. And so the design began to evolve from thinking about that. And then it evolved into thinking about, I saw this rattlesnake skin belt in a tourist shop on the street. And then there was the memory of the paving pattern in the Pantheon, first century, you know, late first century AD. And, they all kind of merge together into that carpet that rolls down the 12 blocks of 16th street. And so if you go to Denver, I don't know that many people will tell you about a snakeskin belt or Navajo trading blankets or the first peoples, but I like the idea that the foundation of the, that the, the terrace, the, the, the fabric of the street, the thing that everything else was on actually had to do with who was there first. And so when I was in Seattle years later, we did a paving pattern that's based on a Salish Indian basket. That's the, the people of Chief Seattle. And it's very beautiful and it's uh, best when wet, which is part of the design. There you see the idea was to do something that was climatologically uh, sensitive, that, that it, what it did was it, uh, it's better wet than dry and that's Seattle, it's better, it's usually wet. But, but it, it had to do with who came first. And, you know, it, they're still there. You know, as a, a friend of mine said about what we call American Indians, you know, we didn't go away. We're still here. <laughs> you know, we're still here, damn it. And, and um, so the notion of having sites tell narratives, this particular site you're looking at in this photo, really is about a memory of a California landscape that was the landscape that was everywhere that has been all wiped out. And so we put a chunk of it and it's not a fake landscape, it's real enough. Um, so the, there were a series of tail ends to that question that I don't think I've dealt with, but I don't know if I can. <laughs> narrative, yes, we, we have it, but my narrative may not be the narrative that will end up being your narrative. So we have three more questions, and I think we still have time for three yeah. questions. Depending Let's try. If, I, if I'm shorter, if I don't go on so long, yes. <laughs> so from Marcella Eaton, do you have any suggestions to help students uh -oh. who have the courage to operate at the scale of the problem <laughs> when they might be discouraged from tackling such complex problems? Well, here's what I would say. Um, the problem with our field is it's not like chess or music where we have child prodigies. It's a, you know what's wrong and you know what to work on, but no one will give you a hundred million dollars to go do stuff because they think, what do you know and who are you and you're young. And so part of the problem is you have to find a way to leverage yourself through time to get the, the platform to operate. And so one of the ways to do that is, is go to work, but work for somebody you can learn a lot and you can push them and poke them, but you know, you're really going to be, if you're an employee, you're, you're there to help the other people get, you know, the woman who's running my firm now, Cindy Sanders, people working on her teams, they're helping her get her work done. But turns out you learn a lot and you should do that for a little while, learn as much as you can, just, suck as much out of the, the bright people 
that you can get next to while you're patiently putting on a few years and moving yourself into a position to have some leverage. Sometimes young people have more leverage working in the public sector, in the public realm, but uh, and in the private realm, you know, there are a few wonderkins, but not in landscape architecture, really. Uh, it, it's a, I know it sounds irritating, uh, <laughs> it is, but I just don't think that what you have to do is continue to tell people that, uh, yes, I'm working on this little piece of stuff over here, and this is important, but there's a bigger problem. And, you, and I think we all have to, every landscape architect needs to be openly political in a thoughtful, not you know, incendiary way. I mean, you need to be forceful, but you also need to not lose your audience. You have to find a way. And um, working your way up through, you know, I've, I moved around from job to rob and quit things and then changed. And I would say that, that it's difficult. It's, it's not an, you know, being a really serious designer is, is a calling. <laughs> it's, it's not a, how to say it? It's not a great business, but it's a great calling. Okay, um, so I, my I want to encourage you. Don't be discouraged, but it's going to take you a while to get people to actually pay attention to you, no matter how smart you are, which is really not necessarily right. But on the other hand, look how much you're going to learn by the time you are able to really push those people around and say, "This is what I want to work on." I, mean, I have not worked on projects like the L.A. River project all my life. As you saw, I, we started with small sites. We had to work our way up. It's not necessarily good or nice. And some of my students came out of the box working on things like, you know, uh, fresh kills and the high line and stuff like that, doing, you know, larger projects, partly because my generation has opened up the possibilities and, and that now municipalities and communities are demanding larger solution. So you're not in a bad position. It's just going to take you a little bit longer than you wish. Next question. From Alexa Lazerna. Thank you for a brilliant lecture, Mr. Olin. What advice would you give architecture students who want their designs to engage with landscape more? Um, learn, a, okay. I, I love the idea that there's some architects out there who want to go on doing architecture, but they also understand that there's something outside the walls that they need to deal with besides, it's, it's not just, architecture, let me say to you, is not mere buildings. Architecture is a, is a, the way we've defined it professionally is unfortunately just a slice of a broad spectrum from re regional planning to designing the tabletop in front of me that, that, that and, and landscape tends to embrace architecture and architecture tends to inhabit landscape. And so you want to develop a sensibility for both sides of the wall, the inside and the outside. And loving the landscape and knowing that part of what architecture can do is to say, well, what is the most just and most effective habitat I can make for people to do what this building is intended to do? And then what, how can I shed some of the habits of the 20th century in terms of its artificial life support and, and make the buildings be more responsive to the landscape? Because then you will be actually working with the landscape. I mean, most of the architects I know need to learn that the world should not be flat, that building, <laughs> that it's better if it's not because then water runs downhill and it doesn't go into your living room. Um, and, and that, you know, water is, is great, except it destroys buildings. And so you want to figure out how to, how to have water and have the water um, leave your building in a way that you can still have it and enjoy it, okay? Where I come from, water, if water got into the building, the building would absolutely come apart. True where you are in Winnipeg. And, but yet, water is so precious. And so part of what architects need to do is fall in love with the processes that are uh, affecting their architecture so that they can integrate them and embrace them and use them to make their architecture better. That's what I would say to you. And we have time for one more. Yeah. <laughs> so, Hong Yu, 
Hmm? I really like your drawings and sketches. My question is uh -oh. what your vision of freehand drawings in our modern days in terms of the creativity and imagination. Um, I'm not quite sure I understand this, the, the transition in that. Um, but let me just say that um, the one thing is that if you can't, it's like if you can't draw it, I don't think you have an idea. Let's put it that way. Um, even if it's an ugly doodle, like my friend Frank Geary makes ugly doodles, but you have to be able to somehow get stuff out of your head onto in some way you can share it with others and you can beat it up and make it better. Every first drawing is usually of a project is ugly. And then you can say, oh, this is terrible. How do I make it better? And one of the things that we do in our office, we have a lot of computers and we have a lot of people who draw freehand. We go back and forth. We don't think either, we don't privilege either one. We try to figure out which thing does the task better at the point we're at. And so in terms of freehand drawing, I, I would recommend everybody do it, do more. You'll only get better if you do more. You can't get better by not doing it. Um, but the thing is, the point is not to make, you're, you're not doing it to make beautiful things. You're doing it because you're thinking out loud and you're trying to put an idea down so you can actually see it and see what you think of it. And so the sketches that I'm doing of existing things, that's one thing. The sketches I'm doing of things that don't exist, they're different somewhat but I've learned enough drawing existing things, I can make proposed things look a bit more real, <laughs> a little more convincing. But, but the drawing, drawing is an act of the mind and not an act of the wrist. Seeing, you know, our eyes are part of our brain that hangs out through two holes in our head. They're not separate, our eyes are not a separate organ like your liver. They're actually a, a piece, a light sensitive piece of the brain. And, uh, and they take in visual information very directly. And when you're drawing, the brain is engaged in your drawing very, very directly. The hand is just something that's flowing through. And I, I that therefore, you know, I can't say that uh, I'm, for, I'm not for or against computers. We have them, they're like telephones, you use them, you know? But, um, but there's things they're great at and there's things they're terrible at. Sketching is one. <laughs> So, oh. sorry, there's one more question I would okay. say. You know, I can like go on, but you, you may run out of time. Go ahead. No, like in a real soccer match, there's always a few minutes over time. We didn't okay. have a yellow <laughs> card or a red card. It's, it's true in soccer and it's true here, right? Okay, go so, ahead. From Deirdre Harris, you speak so beautifully about time, which is an element that is so critical to the maturation and flourishing of a landscape project. Yes. But sometimes it seems as though the worst maintenance related compulsion of humans can easily undo what nature is inclined to do over the course of time. True. Are you able to have some control over how projects are maintained? And if so, how? The answer to that is sometimes, quite often we lose control, but the way to, con to gain and maintain some, I won't call it control, I'll say involvement, uh, would be actually through social skills. It's through in, in engendering a, a trust in your work and your thought and in, and in, in producing a, a kind of sense of uh, that the client wants, wants your help. Uh, over time. And so we have projects, you know, gosh, people we've worked with years ago uh, and, um, and new clients who come back to us uh, often, um, once in a while we'll have a smash up, but not very often. And I, it's partly about trying to, the crude way would be say, get people to like you, but that doesn't, that's not really what it's about. It's, it's about getting them to like your point of view and the help you can give them. And oftentimes we find that at the beginning of a project, people think, oh, the landscape architect, oh, Jesus, you know, and they're busy worrying about the architecture and the engineering and all that stuff. And then years later, everybody else is gone and we're still on the site because the site is never finished. 
uh, you know, the, there is no day one for a landscape and there's never a, a completion, really. We have contract completions, but the site's never done. And so the answer is, it, it has to do with ingratiating yourself with people through your work and through your behavior. Hmm? That's it. Okay, and then the la last comment. Oh. Maybe you like to the question uh, asked by Alipsa Lacerna, but I think that sums it up. Thank you, Laurie. That was wonderful. Oh, thank, thank, Dietmar, thank you. That's, I'm really glad people enjoyed it. Um, you know, it, it's been a lot of fun actually putting this together. Uh, I haven't given this talk ever before, so it, I was worried it was going to be too long, but it, it, we got through it. And thank you all very much for paying attention and staying with us. I appreciate it. Bye-bye. One more brief, going yeah. back to Gina Angelone. I oh, hope Gina. I Yeah, how do you know Gina? No, I don't know her. You know, I did a little bit of some research. So sitting still, uh -huh. a commentary that portraits, you know, is talking about you, this generous and irreverent urban warrior <laughs> gives voice to his prof profoundly social concerns. What do you think? When is the documentary available? Will no, it be sure. available soon? <laughs> or can, can we expect you before the documentary somewhere here in Winnipeg? Uh, what well, will be first? Well, I don't know. First, we have to get rid of the coronavirus or all of us get vaccinated. But um, Gina is still working on the film. She, she's, she kind of ran out of money. She's got, I think she shot just about 90% of it. Um, and she needs some money to help edit it at this point and put it, put it together and put it to bed. Um, I think she's, she's not that far away from finishing, but I would imagine it's going to be another year or two before she can get that done because she's got to fundraise a little bit more. Films are very expensive to produce, it turns out. And um, so that one's going to be a little while. So, so the sitting still with me is going to take a little while, but it, it's, it's mostly shot. It's just about done. It, it needs editing and being put together. Final productions, shall we say. Um, but Winnipeg, you know, we get it, we get, get it. So I get a shot and I can come there. I'll show up. <laughs> okay. Great. Great to hear. Okay. So I'm thank you very you. much, guys. It's been so, nice. Thank you. I think we will close. Okay. Again, thank you from the audience. Very thank inspiring. You. Great. So have a good night. Good night, you too.